Good morning, Morrison Hill. It is nice, it's always nice to be here. You may remember having me speak before as Matt Nance, Matt and Susan Nance missionaries to the country of Jordan for eight years. Morrison Hill was a generous and faithful supporter and friend of ours during that time, and we thank you for that. Now you have to start knowing me as Matt Nance, uh, director of Christian Holy Land Foundation, an organization that Morrison Hill has, has been supporting for years as well. Uh, pri actually supported CHLF prior to my uh, being on the staff of, of CHLF. CHLF is an organization that supports indigenous Christian outreach, indigenous Christian ministry in the Galilee and the countries surrounding Israel. We believe that the best way to reach Middle Easterners is with committed Middle Eastern believers. So thank you for your generous support and your friendship of CHLF. If you'd like to know more about CHLF, I have a, a table out front with some brochures, some business cards, and some Israeli coins that I like to give away to kids and kids at heart. I like to be the only missionary that gives away money when they come to speak at a church. I would appreciate it if you start holding your other missionaries to that standard as well and, and asking them if they brought any money to give away. I think that's only fair. This morning, I'm going to bring a message uh, from the Luke chapter 15. It's the parable of the lost sheep. I, I don't fancy myself as much of a preacher. One of my best friends said, if you're ever in doubt about what to preach about, just preach the prodigal son. I don't, everyone always needs, someone always needs to hear the prodigal son. Well, I don't have a son, so I don't really know much about that, but I have worked on a sheep farm, so I'm going to do my best to bring a message about the prodigal sheep this morning. Uh, if you'll allow me, let me begin by praying the Lord's Prayer in the language of our Middle Eastern brothers and sisters as they are gathering this morning uh, as well to worship. Abana aladhi fi samawati li ataqaddis ismuka li ati malakutuka li taqon mashiatika kama fi samai kathalika ala ardi khubzana kathafana atani al-yom waqfar lana dhanubana kama nakfaru nakhnu aydin lulmudna bina ilayna Amen. You'll forgive me if I stumbled over that last luka. Now let's turn our Bibles and our minds to the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my, lost, my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Now, I have a question for you this morning, um, brothers and sisters. When you hear this story, as we have grown up hearing this story in Sunday school and in our lives in church, where do we place ourselves in this story? Well, what character are we in this story? Go ahead and call it out to me. Lost. We're the lost sheep? Okay. We're the, we're the one that got lost in the wilderness. Yes, absolutely. Anybody else have a character that we, ought, that we are in this story? The shepherd? Yeah, absolutely. Anybody else? Sometimes we're the 99, right? Sometimes we're the 99. I believe, it is my hunch, that the majority of the time when we listen to this story or when we hear this story, we place ourselves in the role of the lost sheep. That I was that lost sheep. Jesus, I was lost in the wilderness and Jesus came and found me. And I, absolutely, I think that the story supports that, that that is a uh, legitimate interpretation of this parable. However, I want to draw our attention this morning to another reading of this story, possibly a Middle Eastern reading of this story, in which we take into account the full context of the story. 
Now, there are two, let's go to the next slide. There are two very important rhetorical devices at work in this uh, story. Uh, Middle Easterners, Easterners use different ways to make a point and different ways to make an argument than we typically do as, as Westerners. A Westerner will start, when they want to start with a lesson, when they want to teach a lesson, when they want to make a point, they'll oftentimes start with the point and just give you the point. Jesus is love. God is loving. And then let me tell you some stories or give you some examples that will illustrate the point that I just made. God is love. Now, an Easterner or a Middle Easterner of Jesus was will oftentimes tell a story first. And, and, and then we can draw the lessons out of the story. That that story is, should be taken seriously as a well-crafted, intentional, purposely told story that is full of truth. When Jesus tells the parable of the lost sheep or any of the other parables, he is not telling a kid's story. He is telling a very well-crafted story that has a well-crafted, intricate argument contained in it to give us adults a lesson, to teach us about himself, to teach us about his heart, that we return to the metaphor, we return to the story to get the truth. And we can look at it from different ways. So when Jesus tells the story of the lost sheep, we can see ourselves as that lost sheep. We can see ourselves as the 99. But I want to bring up this morning, and I want to commend to you, that we should see it as the original audience saw it. And that is as a shepherd. Second rhetorical device that is at work here is... Uh, can we can see an example of this in this verse from Isaiah? This uh, verse in, in Isaiah is a metaphor, uh, a metaphor of Jesus, the, the Messiah being a lamb that is led to the slaughter. But second way of making a point that is common to Easterners is something called a chiasm or something called a parallelism in which the first verse and the last verse bookend each other, the next to the first and the next to the last, and then in the middle is the point of the story. This is a type of divide, this is a type of way of making an argument or type of way of making a point called a chiasm that is found commonly in Hebrew and other Eastern, Middle Eastern type uh, uh, stories and writings and stuff like that. Well, I can't get into it all this morning, but the point is that in these stories, the story is actually pointing, the way that the story is crafted, it points to the middle, that the middle of the story is where the point is found. And you can see how it works uh, in, this, in this verse from Isaiah. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Now let's look at the very last verse. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Let's look at the next one. Yet he did not open his mouth next to the last, so he did not open his mouth. What's the very center of this? Like a lamb that was led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent. This is the story that we are trying to internalize this, the emotional reaction that we're trying to get when we think about the Messiah that he was led away to be killed. A metaphor like this connects us on an emotional level in a way that a concrete, um, objectively crafted point would not make. If it just said, God is going to send a Savior and he's going to be killed, it doesn't necessarily engage our emotions in a way that a story of a little lamb being led up to the altar and having its throat cut does for us. We can feel that in every part of our body, in our emotion, in our heart. It should grab us. So the same thing is happening here in Luke chapter 15. The context of the story is, is found in verses 1 and 2. The tax collectors and the religious leaders were, were saw that, I'm sorry, the tax collectors and the sinners were drawing near to Jesus and hearing his teaching and following him around and wanting to be around him. Let's go to the next slide, please. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled and they said, this man is eats with sinners. That's a big deal. 
to people whose lives have been devoted to staying ceremonially clean and not associating with things that are unclean. For them to eat with sinners is a non-starter. They can't do it. Middle Eastern meals are very intimate affairs. Oftentimes you're eating from a common platter and you're eating with your hands. You can't do that with people that are dirty. You can't do that with people that you think their dirtiness perverts your relationship to God. You can't do that with those people. Staying clean is the most important thing to them. And for Jesus, this person who says He's the Messiah, this person who says He's the Son of God, to be eating with sinners, that act in their mind disqualifies Him from being who He says He is. He cannot be the Son of God and eating and dipping His hands into a common bowl with people that are as sinful and as dirty as he is. So they bring this up to him and they say, he's eating with sinners. You can't be who you say you are and be, and, and be doing this. There are certainly things that your pastor could not do and remain a pastor of this church. There are people and things and places that he could not be and remain his position. It would disqualify him from being here. I would say that there are things that politicians and leaders could do that would disqualify them from their service, but apparently that's not true. (laughs) But I would hope that there are places that you cannot find your pastor. Like at a Gators game or something like that. I don't know. (laughs) But for them... Jesus' action towards sinners disqualified him from being who he says he is. So he hears this. This is actually, this actually is a legitimate accusation that they are leveling against him. That's a legitimate accusation. It's wrong, but it's legitimate. So he answers them with three stories. The, The sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And I want to point out, I want to commend to you the idea that these are very serious answers. These are not children's stories. These are very serious answers that we can learn a tremendous about from. But let's not lose sight of the fact that he is telling this story to the religious leaders. It is to them. And they are accusing him of misconduct by associating with sinners. So he tells this story. He launches into this story. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness? Now, let me pause there real quickly. This is a little aggressive on Jesus' part. It's a little aggressive on Jesus' part, which is fine. Because for a religious leader to imagine themselves as a shepherd is kind of a stretch. Being a shepherd is a very dirty job. It's a job for, in the Middle East, it's a job for low-class people. It's a job for simple people. It's a job for uneducated people. This is to, for them to, for Jesus to say, imagine you're a shepherd, is, is confrontational, a little bit insulting to these religious leaders that were probably in their robes and their vestments and staying clean and all this kind of stuff. To say, imagine you're this very, very dirty worker. Okay, that's, that's kind of aggressive. Okay? Jesus is not uncomfortable with being called a shepherd. He's not uncomfortable with being associated with a humble post. But it, would, it was for them. Okay? Secondly, and losing one of them, apparently not only are you a dirty shepherd, but you're not a very good one because you've lost one of your sheep. Now this is a big deal. And remember, he's telling this story to elicit an emotional reaction, losing a sheep. A sheep costs a lot of money. We, Susan and I have been in the Middle East and seen 12, 13, 14-year-old boys herding 100 sheep across the interstate before. We've had visitors with us, and I've pointed that out. I was like, look at that boy. That boy's family lives in a tent. 
in the, in the middle of the wilderness, and he has 100 sheep. Each sheep costs $500. He's leading $50,000. His 12-year-old boy is leading $50,000 across the street, and that flock of sheep represents his entire family's accumulated wealth. It's like you go and you take out your 401k, you get it out in $100 bills, and you, sit, you put it in your 12-year-old's pocket and tell him to go on a school field trip. That's, you know, a little scary, okay? So you've, you're, not, you're not only a, ba- a shepherd, but you're apparently a bad one because you've lost a sheep. Does not leave the 99 in the wilderness. And here comes the chiasm. And go after the one that is lost until he finds it. When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. The center of the argument is rejoicing that the lost has come home. He draws a contrast here between a bad shepherd who loses his sheep and a good shepherd who goes and finds that sheep. And the center of the argument is that when the lost sheep comes home, there is rejoicing not only by the shepherd, but there is rejoicing by the community of the shepherd. The shepherd's friends and neighbors celebrate with him. He goes from heartache and angst over a lost sheep. Who's ever lost a child in the supermarket? You lost a child at Lowe's? (laughs) Susan and I lost a child in the the yard the other day. (laughs) I mean, we have two. It's, it's, I don't know, we're, we're new to this. Okay. You lose a child in a supermarket, you know that panicky feeling. You know it, right? I, you, some of you are feeling that right now. If I took everybody's blood pressure right now, some of your pulses would be up a little bit right now over that feeling of losing a child in the supermarket. But losing a sheep that, as a 12-year-old boy, 14-year-old boy, most shepherds are very young, you lose something that's very valuable to your family, you know that that's going to cause quite a bit of stress. A good shepherd feels that stress over a lost sheep and goes and finds it. A bad shepherd can't be bothered. Bad shepherds lose sheep and aren't bothered by it. We all, as just as much as we are that lost sheep, we are all also a shepherd. And we need to decide, are we going to be a good shepherd or are we going to remain or be bad shepherds? Most of us have to go through a change to become, go from being a bad shepherd to being a good shepherd. It has to, something has to change in our hearts. I've preached over the past eight years of ministry and to Muslims and ministry in the Middle East. I've preached to churches you know, across the, the southeast, and I preach about Muslims and loving Muslims and loving Middle Easterners, and so, every time somebody will come up to me and say, well, I just can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, you know? I can't love those people. And then I hear stories from people who said, I, I used to hate those people, but now I've had this experience, or your sermon touched me, or somebody else's sermon touched me, or I read this book, and my heart has changed towards those people. We all have to go through a a change in our hearts to go from the bad shepherd that can't be bothered by the lost sheep to the good shepherd who goes and hikes across into the wilderness to find that lost sheep. This this picture here that we have, the the woman on the right is my wonderful wife Susan. The woman on your left is a friend of ours. She was a Christian, an Arab Christian that we met in the first year that we were in in Jordan uh, nine years ago or whatever it was. And we were, Susan and I were engaged in refugee ministry to Muslim, Syrian Muslims. You, Morrison Hill supported us in that. And she told this Christian woman, Arab Christian woman, said, what are you doing with those refugees? And we said, oh, well, you know, we go and visit them. We take them mattresses. We take them blankets. We take them medicine. We take them food. And she goes, they're Muslims? And I'm like, yeah, they're Muslims. She's like, are you, are, you take them food? And we're like, yes, we take them food. She's like, <sighs> she was very bothered by this. She goes, it's like, 
feeding baby snakes so they can grow up to bite and kill your kids. Like, oh my gosh, <laughs> you go wash your mouth out after you said that. Like, geez, that's, that's awful. And then we befriended this person. We began inviting her to go along and help us with the Arabic when we were visiting these refugees. She befriended a young Muslim woman who has three, had three little girls. Her husband had been killed in the war. She was a widow. She was all alone in a town, and she knew nobody. This, woman, this Christian woman befriended her, took her under her wing. We, over a period of a year, we shared the gospel with this woman, you know, repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. She kept rejecting the message. She kept rejecting the message. She told us she wasn't, she didn't believe in Jesus. She didn't believe in Jesus over and over and over. And then we were gone one day, and we were actually in America, and our Christian friend went to visit her young Muslim friend, and she called me, the, the Christian woman called me on the phone, and she's screaming and yelling, Matthew, 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 you won't believe it, you won't believe it, you won't believe it. And I was like, what won't I believe? She goes, she believes, she believes, she's accepted the gospel, she's a believer now. And I'm like, that's amazing, amen, praise the Lord. You know, she goes, Matt, you wouldn't believe it. She's like a new person now. And I said, I think there's two new people in this relationship because you have been transformed right before my very eyes from being a bad shepherd to being a good shepherd. Good shepherds feel responsible for lost sheep. When we know or are aware of lost sheep, people in our presence, lost people in our community, lost people in our world. We, if we are going to be good shepherds, we feel responsible. We feel like we have a responsibility to reach them. We reach them in our homes, we reach them in our schools, we reach them in our neighborhoods, we reach them through giving generously to this church which supports missionaries and ministers across the world. Those are all actions of somebody who feels responsible for lost sheep. Third, the lost sheep are not innocent. You can't get out of this by saying, well, that sheep ran off all by itself. Jesus knows that. Western shepherds drive their sheep. I used to work on a sheep farm when I was in school. You run along and drive the sheep like this, okay? Sheep are incredibly stupid animals, okay? Eastern shepherds, Middle Eastern shepherds lead their sheep. And we've seen these teenage boys lead flocks of sheep across a four-lane highway before. You just have to step out and the next sheep behind you will follow you and all the other sheep follow the one behind him. So the sheep that gets lost is not being a very good sheep. All he had to do was follow the shepherd or follow the person in front of him. He has been or she has been a bad sheep. That's okay. The story doesn't absolve the shepherd of his responsibility to find the lost sheep because the sheep ran off by itself. That's okay. We still go and find it. The sheep is powerless to help itself. Sheep are not like golden retrievers. You can't lose them on vacation at Myrtle Beach and they follow you home. They're not like that. They're dumb. If you lose a sheep in the wilderness, it's gone forever unless you go find it. Going after lost sheep is risky and costly. It costs the sh a good shepherd something to go after a lost sheep. Whatever got and killed the sheep could kill the shepherd. Anybody who's ever been to the Middle East knows that the land of the Holy Land is very rocky and rugged. When I was growing up, I thought that the, middle, the Holy Land looked like Ireland. You know, like these rolling hills, a little babbling brook in the valley, and these white fluffy sheep. No, no, no. It looks, the Holy Land looks a, more, a lot more like Colorado or something, you know, New Mexico or something like that. It's very rocky and rugged ground. It's hard work to go after a lost sheep. It's dangerous. It costs you something. When the good shepherd finds the lost sheep, he does not punish it. He puts it on his shoulders and he carries it home. When he brings it home, the community rejoices that he has brought the lost sheep home. The community does not point fingers. The community does not chastise. The community does not grumble. The community does not complain. The community rejoices when the lost sheep has come home. This is the center of the story. As the band comes up, 
the early church memorialized this story over and over through statues and other artwork, artful expressions. At this time, the cross, in the early church, the cross was still a very gruesome thing, very uncomfortable for people to look at the cross. They use statues that depicted the lost, the shepherd and the lost sheep to point people towards the gospel. Many people have commented that the earliest of these statues, the earliest of these art representations of the lost sheep show a sheep that is disproportionately larger than the shepherd to highlight the burden and the cost of going after lost sheep. I am thankful that Morrison Hill is a church full of good shepherds who rejoice when the lost come home. Let us continue to commit to the way of being a good shepherd who goes after lost sheep. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Morrison Hill. Thank you so much for all the good shepherds here. Thank you for the good work that happens here. Thank you for the good work that is supported and sponsored here. If there are any lost sheep in this congregation this morning, Lord, I pray that they find their way home. If some of us are on the bubble of whether we need to be a good shepherd or a bad shepherd in someone's life, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would guide us and embolden us to walk in the way of the good shepherd. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.